realize is having that spiritual oxygen oxygen is just as easy as that first breath a baby has. So whenever when a baby is born, think about it. A baby is born, you know, women, women, you know, they push, they push. The baby comes out, and then automatically the baby breathes. No one has to tell the baby to breathe. The baby breathes, or you know, if everything is good with the child, the baby breathes automatically, and that's just how natural, um, you know, spiritual oxygen is. If we just remain calm, if we just forget about ourselves and just trust in God, it's natural for that Holy Spirit to move. The reason the Holy Spirit doesn't move how it can move is because of us. It's because we want to, you know, do what we want to do. We have our own agenda. We have our own emotions. We have our own guilty pleasures. We want to do things our way. We have this plan, and we believe that we understand how everything should be drawn out and which direction we should go. So then it becomes harder for us. So what we're doing is we're actually clogging, you know, um, our nostrils. We're clogging our spiritual nostrils, for lack of a better um, reference. But spiritual, spiritual oxygen, spiritual breathing is just as easy as when that, that newborn um, comes out. So we have to understand that it's really our choice now as believers, as we begin to mature, it's really our choice if we allow God to come in, if we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and we decide to breathe in that Holy Spirit and, and allow it to run rampant in our lives. So we already spoke about if we don't have the spiritual oxygen, if we, we're not breathing in the spiritual realm, then we're, we're automatically dead. But some people, because we know there are people who are non-believers, right? I like to say the non-believers or us before we were really, really um, Christians, or even some people here, if you're not, you know, 100% on it. And, and sometimes all of us can be like this, where we're really on life support. What does that mean? Because, you know, sometimes you're on spiritual breathing. How does the Holy Spirit move there? We know there are people who may not be uh, fully you know, in church or some people who are tap dancing around the lines, but God still speaks and works through them. It's because they're on life support. So what happens with life support is there's a machine that's stuck to you and the machine is helping you to breathe. I call that a little bit of extra grace. You know, Christ is like really holding you down and he's really making sure that you don't feel the wrath of God. So a lot of us, we get on this um, life support and we begin to see the glimpses of God speaking and we begin to see glimpses of the miracles happening in our lives or glimpses of miracles happening in other people's lives. Now, anyone who's ever been on, on life support before, they'll tell you the difference between having a machine help them breathe and then when they're off that machine and being able to breathe on their own, they're able to do things a lot better. They don't have to worry. I don't know if you've ever seen those people with the tanks and the tanks are like connected to their nostrils and they're going around. Those people can't really run. Those people can't really have fun, like how they want to have fun. However, what happens is when they no longer need that tank and they no longer need, need that connected to them, they're able to run, they're able to jump, they're able to live that normal life. God wants us to be that way. He doesn't want us to have a tank connected to us, but he wants us to understand that we can breathe naturally. We can naturally have that same breath of life that Christ has. We can breathe with Christ. And when we do that, what does it mean? It means in the spiritual realm, we're able to run, we're able to jump, we're able to experience God on a higher level and on a deeper level. And I feel that many of us, unfortunately, we get stuck with being on life support because we're, we're so uh, addicted to it and, and we don't understand that God wants us to take, a, to take us to another take us to another level. When we read the Bible and, and we hear people preaching, oftentimes we, we see miracles, we hear people talk about spiritual warfare, angels and demons. Um, people are talking about these great giants uh, of the Bible. Like last Sunday, I was at second service, and the minister who, who, who preached, it was a powerful sermon. And he was talking about, you know, Father Abraham. And everybody knows Father Abraham. You know, like, he's the man. Or everybody knows King David. Or everybody knows Ruth. And we hear about all these giants in the Bible, all these people who did miraculous things, who God used to a whole different degree. And then for us, it's like, how do we get there? We're not able to do it. The reason that the, the people were able to do such great things is because they were energized by the creator. And us, we have this tendency to just be energized by our own might. So we're, we're living on our own. So we have self-energy. But God doesn't want that. When, you have, when you're energizing yourself, things are only going in one direction. You know, But when you allow God to energize you, it's like a current. I don't know how many people, everyone here should have took science at some point in your life. And I remember when you had to do the little battery thing, 
you know, and they would show you in the diagram how the current runs when you put the switch on. The way it runs is that the current is flowing and it's going two different opposite ways. And that's how it happens. We're giving up to God. And as we give up to God, God is also giving us so much. When Sister Gabby was, was, was speaking in the beginning of praying, she kept saying, fill me up. And when she was saying, fill me up, I automatically thought about the Holy Spirit, right? God wants to fill us up with the Holy Spirit. But then she began singing that song that says, you know, if you provide the fire, Lord, I'll provide the sacrifice. If you pour out your spirit, God, then I will open up. And, and that's exactly what God wants to do. God is saying, I have some fire here for you. I have some spirit. I have some wind. I have some oxygen that I have, that, that's here for you. But you need to provide the sacrifice. You need to be willing to come on your own. You need to be willing to open up because it's a two-way street. If we're doing it on our own, it's just one direction and that's it and you're going to fade away. But if you allow Christ to come and energize you, just like these giants that we always hear and then hear about and then read about in the Bible, then it's a two-way street and the current will always keep going and you'll always be energized and, and that switch will stay on all the time. You never have to worry about it running out. But there are some people who unfortunately never get it. They live, they die, and they never understand the spirituality. They never understand what it truly means. And that's because they were always dead to Christ. And I would hope that none of us here are like that. I would, even when I was like preparing, I was like, God, I hope I'm not like that. I had to check my life real quick. But like, God, I really hope that I'm not like that. I'm not a person who doesn't really get it. Because you could be in church and you hear about the miracles. People are always saying this and that. But do you truly get it? Or is it just you were born into church? I, I was reading a status today. Um, my friend was a minister out in Louisiana. I forgot what she put. But it was something along the lines of, maybe it wasn't her. It was somebody who put something on Facebook. Be afraid of those who inherited church or who inherited Christ. Meaning you were just born into this thing. You know, or you borrowed Christ. You know, you were in trouble, and because of your trouble, that's why you got Christ. But you never really learned to love him for who he is. Or you were just born into this, so automatically it's like you inherit this thing called lift your hands up, you inherit this thing called join a choir, join a worship team, start preaching, you know, um, help out the church. You inherited it because you saw it from your parents. So for you, it's like, oh, this is what we do. This is what, this is what my family, this is what the Johnsons do. <laughs> we go to church every Sunday. We come every Friday, but that's what we do. Be afraid of those people because they don't really understand Christ. It's something that they inherited and they don't understand the value. You ever see a spoiled um, rich kid? A spoiled rich kid is because their life, that's all they see. They're in this bubble and that's all that they believe in. So they don't understand reality. They don't understand the value of what they have. And sometimes that, that's us Christians. We don't understand the value of what we have. We don't understand the true value of Christ because we kind of inherited it, you know? Maybe our parents weren't born in church, but most of us were born in church. Or if we weren't, we started coming to church when we were like, what, eight? So really, you were born in church. So you have to be afraid of those people because they don't really understand it. And sometimes really explaining the spirituality and, and everything that we're speaking about to people is kind of like this thing called the... Um, called ebb and flow. What does that mean? Ebb and flow is like water movement. The ebb is when the, the water is leaving the shore, right? The flow is when the water is coming back. What does that mean? It's something that's so natural, it's something that's so simple, but to everyone it seems like a big thing. You've ever been to the beach and you see the, the waves coming, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's a wave, it's crazy. No, it's not crazy. It's something natural that happens all the time. It's actually rather very simplistic. Water movement, water flow is very simplistic. Water is always going to move. Water is always going to flow. It's natural and it's simple. And it's the same thing with God. God is really simple. He meets us right where we are. But us, we make it much more complicated than it needs to be. Just like the song said, he's providing the fire. He's pouring out the winds and the spirits. All we need to do is come with the sacrifice. All we need to do is open up. It's just as simple as that. Christ is saying, sacrifice and open up to me. That's it. That's all we need. But we make it much more complicated than it needs to be. And sometimes we kind of psych ourselves out with this Christian world. So how can we really explain it to another person and get them to truly understand it? But this month, but this week, we're talking about fresh wind and fresh fire. So I began to think of Acts 2, 1 to 12. And we're going to go there. Really quickly, Acts 2, 1 to 12, and I'll read it. For, I'll read, uh, yeah, I'll read the whole thing. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord 
in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Oops. And this, and when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues with wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? And that's oftentimes what happens when we're when we're dealing with you know the Christian world. Anytime we see something supernatural, anytime we see God moving in someone's life, God opening up, it's always like whatever does this mean? Whenever we see God moving, it's like what does this mean? It's something that's like that marvels us. And yes, we should be in awe of God, but we shouldn't be shocked about God. You know, and I think that's that's something as, as Christians we we don't understand. You can be in awe of Him, like wow, God, you moved. But to be shocked is to say. I didn't think this would happen. Like this, like this is unlike you, God. When someone does something shocking, it's something that's unlike them, it's something that's rare. When God does miracles, that's not something rare for God. Miracles are an everyday thing for him. And we need to begin to understand that and get it. But this passage it begins to speak of the day of Pentecost. The one thing that I like about this, it says the people heard a sound, but the sound that they heard was the wind blowing. So there we see the first part of the sermon, we see the wind blowing. After the winds blow, what happens? They, they begin manifesting, they're worshiping, all these things occurring. Then there comes fire, and the fire comes on top of them. So they heard the winds, and the wind came into the place that they were in. And then there was fire, which allowed them to manifest. Winds and fire working together, allowing them to manifest. And I want us to remember that. I begin to think about chemistry, right? And I think about how does fire come about? Fire is like really three, three major parts. The first part is heat. The second part is light. The third part is oxygen or combustion, right? You need oxygen, right? And fire comes when you have those three things really working together and it combusts. Fire comes, poof, and we're all like marveled. But the thing about fire is that where there is no oxygen, there can be no fire. Where there is no oxygen, there can be no fire. And last, um, two weeks ago, we said one thing. We said, Whatever happens in the natural, in the world, the physical world, it's a representation of the spiritual world. So when I begin to think about that, I'm saying, God, in the natural, if there's no oxygen, there could be no fire. So what does that tell me? If the Spirit of God is not in your life, you can never be on fire for God. So when you're asking, where's the desire? Where's the want? Where's the push? Where's the more? Well, you need to go and get the Spirit of God. That's what you're lacking in your life. That's what you need, and we have to begin to understand that, and we have to really um, own it. So how can we be? How can we really be on fire for Christ, and how can we sustain that fire if we haven't allowed His Holy Spirit in? We haven't allowed His breath of life inside of us, and that's what we need to understand. But when the Holy Spirit comes, the way that it comes, it comes gushing. You, we, we, we saw it in Acts that it came gushing. It was mighty. I can imagine the people being blown back, right? So it comes, and change has to occur. Things can't remain the same when the Holy Spirit comes. That's why you're on fire for Christ, because a change occurs automatically. Things begin to combust. And that wind of change that comes, it's actually a good thing. Oftentimes we see changes being a bad thing, but they're different. They're, the, the, this type of change is a catalyst for growth. And I want to kind of highlight certain things that I have here. First of all, this change is responsible for making us, for helping us make determinations about our life experiences. So we begin to gain perspective based on everything um, that's out there for us. We begin to gain perspective based on the options and opportunities that are made available to us if we open ourselves to them. What does that mean in plain English? It means that though that change begins to give you discernment. It begins to give you insight. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, discernment automatically comes. You're gonna be able to make better decisions, right? The next thing is that change isn't about learning lessons and being good people. We oftentimes, uh, think this walk 
this Christian world and this living in society is about being the best person you can be. Hip, hip, hurry. No, it's not about being the best person you can be. It's not about just learning lessons. It's actually to facilitate, facilitate momentum that can propel us into deeper experiences. God wants to always take us to another level. So whenever change comes, good and bad change, by the way, this is not just talking about good stuff in your life. Whenever change comes, it's a way that God wants to use it as momentum. He wants to propel you to another level. But we, we don't have that mindset that God is really ready to birth something else through me. And once we begin to understand that, we'll see it differently. So it, it's really up to us to decide, do we begin to repeat the different occurrences? Do we begin to repeat the different lifestyles? Do we begin to still hang around the same people, still go to the same environment, or do we begin to change? Because God wants to take you to a deeper level, a higher level, but we have to make a change for ourselves. So without the momentum of change, life kinda is worthless. If life was the same every day, everyone were in, you know, black and gray every day, you know, in and out, you get really bored, Life gets really whack. But that's not God. I don't serve a God who's like lame or who's whack. God always has these new experiences. He always wants us to learn more about it. There's so much that we can learn about. I forgot who I was talking to. Maybe I was going to do that. When it talks about us just using like 10% of our brains as human beings, right? And I remember the movie Lucy, all of a sudden like she uses like 20% and 30%. And as she's using more and more percentages of her brain, she's able to do different things. She's able to like, stop time and control what people are doing, right? But that's just because she's getting into a deeper understanding of her mindset and what she can do. Imagine God, as we go deeper into understanding who God is, we begin to really understand everything he can do in our lives. You mean, God, if I ask for it, it'll happen. People came up here with their testimony, started talking about speaking it into existence. How did you know about that? Do you know about speaking it into existence because a good preacher said it one day and you're like, I'm going to always say that. Or do you know about speaking it into existence because you've seen God do it for someone else or you've seen God do it for you in the past and you've learned that about him. So now you can claim that and move on in, with that dynamic, with that dimension of God in your life. And God wants to do that for us all the time. He wants to show us new dimensions and new levels of him that we can grab onto and we can carry out and it could be natural to you like coming up here and saying, speaking it into existence because that is so true. But if you didn't really experience that, then are they just fluffy words that you're saying or is it something that you really believe and understand? And, and we need to begin to ask ourselves this. So we're speaking about fresh winds, fresh fire, right? So talking about the winds that came in, mighty winds blowing and everyone being startled in Acts 2 and then the fire that comes up on top of them. What does wind do to fire? I had to begin to think about it. Have you, have you guys ever seen like the news when they start talking about California? Perfect example. They always have forest fires, right? California always has forest fires. Why do they have forest fires? And they're like, oh man, they just got 100 acres. I'm like, why is it always like 100, 300 acres? In? And you guys still have trees in the forest. So it's crazy. But it's because the wind actually, because you know, fire needs oxygen. And the more wind that comes near fire, the fire begins to grow. It begins to grow and then it begins to spread. So the wind comes and the wind takes that fire and the wind allows the fire to go different places and to travel. And oftentimes when we look at this fire, we think that it's bad. But the fire isn't always bad. But before we go into that, we have to understand like, why is the fire able to spread? It's not just because the wind is picking it up. This is, this is the reason the fire spreads. The wind is taking the fire to places that are dry and to places that are dead. So there are dry leaves, there are dead plants, and the wind is taking it to those places because that needs to be cleaned up. There are things that God wants to do in your life and wants to do in this society. We have to be on fire for him. We have to have that fire. And his Holy Spirit is going to take us to different places that are dry and dead and is going to allow us to clean it up. But first, we need to have that Holy Spirit with inside of us and we need to allow the fire of Christ to burn within us. When those two things happen, God is going to take you places and everywhere you go, if it was dry and dead, you're gonna clean it up. You're gonna clean it up just like the fire does to all these places. So read this real quick. People often think that fires are a bad thing. And we said that. But did you know that authorities will actually sometimes create fires on purpose so that new things can burn? And I'm gonna explain it to you right here. Right here. In the United States, 
Um, we're so used to seeing people put out the fires that we spoke about in California. But what happens is, in the 60s, they realized that these big giant trees, um, they're called the sequoia trees, uh, they're actually in diameter, like how big the trunk is. They're the largest tree um, in diameter in the world. There's no other tree that has a larger diameter than the sequoia tree, right? So what they started noticing in the United States in the 60s was that these sequoia trees were not growing. They weren't growing how they um, should be. And they, these trees are usually found in like Western USA, so going back to California. So what did they do? They understood that fires were a crucial part of the life cycle of these trees. These trees needed fire in order to kind of make more trees. But how does that work? This is why. When, fi when there's fire, fire takes warm air up because we all know heat rises, right? So when the heat begins to rise and it goes to the top of the trees, these trees, these sequoia trees, they have cones. And what happens is those cones, which normally are dry, when the fire goes up there, now the cones begin to split and bust open. And what happens when the cones bust open? The cones are kind of like a fruit, you could say, right? When it busts open, what's inside of a fruit? When it busts open, seeds. So now these cones bust open and the seeds go to the ground. And now when the seeds grow, um, when they split and the seeds pop out, they go to the ground. Not only does, does the fire allow warm air to go up so that the cones could bust open and the seeds could go to the ground, but the fire also cleans all the ground. So all the undergrowth, anything that's like bad soil, anything that, that would be like pollutants that would not cause you know plants to grow, the fire comes and it cleans all that up. And when it cleans all that up, and the seeds bust open from the cones, now, because of that fire, it allows the seeds to germinate. And uh, I don't know if you guys know what germinate means, but it's when the seeds bust open, you know, start creating and growing. So it allows the seeds to start growing, and then those seeds eventually become more sequoia trees. So here's something that we always think forest fires are bad, but in the 60s, authorities learned that they need to control these forest fires, right? And when they control these forest fires, then they could have these great trees that everyone loves to see, these great plants, these great fruits that we, for lack of a better term, like fruits of the spirit, then these things could begin to grow. So what does that say? I began to think like, God, wow, you want us to be on fire and you're going to take us to these new heights. And when we go to these new heights, change is going to happen. Not only are we going to clean any place that's dead and dry, but because we're on fire for you, just like the natural is just a representation of the spiritual, because we're on fire for you, it's going to allow for seeds to be able to spread and bust open and to be able to grow. See, your fire and your wind is needed for certain splits to occur. And when those splits occur, just like when the cone busts open, then wholeness begins to come in because that's how the cycle is fulfilled for the sequoia tree. The fire needs to rise up, the winds need to take it to another level, and then the cones bust open, the seeds fall on the ground, the seeds germinate, and now the sequoia tree life cycle is complete. So God wants us to have that fire, have that wind, so that we can cause things that are not good, things that are evil, things that are debauchery, cause those things to split up and then allow the seeds to germinate and then for wholeness to occur. And God wants that. But it has to be under the control of the Holy Spirit, under the guise and guidance of God. I begin to think of Ephesians 5, um, 18, where it, um, in the second part of it, it begins to tell us to be, um, be on fire for God, have the Holy Spirit, but be under the control of God as well. So be on fire for God but be under the control of the spirit. And that's exactly what happens here when we start talking about these fires. Um, you know, they're fires that authorities have the control of because they understand that if they, these fires can be used for good. And God says that the thing that you think is bad for you, the thing that, that you think makes you weird, that makes you awkward, if you just trust in God, you allow him to let you grow in that dimension, just grow in your natural state and who you are, and you're on fire for God and use those gifts and talents, He's going to cause green me. God wanted to bring these new things, fresh winds, God, fresh fires in our life, just like on the day of Pentecost. We want to be able to manifest. We want to be able to take in the Holy Spirit. I think that as a church society, not, not us here specifically, but globally as a church, I feel like the church has kind of abandoned.
and in the Holy Spirit. That now we live in, in a church society that's just more so coming to a place and having like concert like atmospheres. You know, you go, and, and I'm not taking shots at any churches, right? But sometimes there are churches that you go to, and it's like you're walking into a concert every Sunday, right? But it's cool. But what did you walk out of outside of like that concert flashing lights feel? When you leave there, you're still empty. So we've come into a place where now churches and, and church service has become a show. But God doesn't want church and church church service to be to be a show. He wants it to be a place where the Holy Spirit manifests. And I think that the church of today no longer speaks of the Holy Spirit. It no longer uh, tells people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It no longer tells, explains to people what it means to not grieve the Holy Spirit. And we have to become a people that not only are, do we desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but once we're filled with that Holy Spirit, that we understand we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're not to do anything that would turn the Holy Spirit off. And that's what Christ wants to tell us. So I began to think about this one thing, uh, and God took me to John 20, 20 to 22. And it's after Christ resurrected from the dead. It says that the disciples were overjoyed to see him in, uh, in verse 20. They were overjoyed to see him. They were very happy to see him. But then when you go um, towards 22, it said Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So right before Christ went, the last thing that he really wanted to, right before he, you know, um, went up to heaven, one of the last things he did was he breathed onto them and gave them that Holy Spirit, gave them that fresh wind, gave them, you know, that fresh oxygen. And we all know John comes before Acts, so it's after the Holy Spirit, God has already given them the Holy Spirit, he's already imparted that upon them. Later on, will they see the fires begin to go into their life. So we have to receive the Holy Spirit in order to be on fire for God, in order for our spirit, our, our gifts, and our talents to truly manifest. Everybody always talks about being anointed and, and all this stuff. Do you have God's Holy Spirit? Concentrate on that first. Everyone's always fascinated with the anointing. Focus on the Holy Spirit and all the anointing, all that other glitz and glamour stuff. God will take care of that. But the Holy Spirit is very pivotal. And simply put, when the, when the Messiah, the risen Messiah, Jesus Christ, when he breathed on the disciples, that changed the world. It changed the momentum and the direction of the world. Then you saw the gospel just being spread at rapid rates. People going to different continents, different countries, different people, um, different you know cultures, and truly spreading the word of God. And God wants to do that with us. He wants us to spread his gospel. He wants us to be a people who our gifts and talents reach its maximum peak, that we are renewed through his Holy Spirit and through being on fire. So the last breath that Jesus took on the cross, this is what happened. The world was given a gift of eternal life, right? And the gift of spiritual breath. But then when the Son of Man, when Jesus rose from the grave, that new life began to spread across the globe. So first he breathed it out. It was out there in the atmosphere. When he comes back and rises up, that's when it began to spread across the globe because we all know when Christ comes back, now he still has work that he's doing with the disciples, spreading the word, and then he imparts the Holy Spirit on them specifically so that they may go and spread it. So that new life has found its way to you and has found its way to me. And the Holy Spirit is knocking on our doorsteps. And the question is, are we going to open up our minds? Are we going to open up our bodies? Are we going to be a living sacrifice and allow the fire of God to come in within us, allow the Holy Spirit to come within us and manifest? When we go back to the book of Acts, this is something that I really want us to truly understand. The wind of the Spirit in the book, in the book of Acts signifies the birth of the church. At Pentecost, a lot of theologians will say it was about 120 people. So the, book, the book of Acts, chapter 2, has about like 40 um, verses, but we've read the first 12. But when you go down to all the rest of you know the verses, down to like 48 or whatever, you begin to see what I'm about to say. So they say there were about 120 people there, right? And this wind of the Holy Spirit signified the birth of the church. 120 people there. But did you know that because the Holy Spirit was manifesting, they say that about 3,000 people came? So when the winds of God came, when the fire of God came, and people began to manifest, not only was the church officially birthed, but the church automatically grew. So imagine within an hour, from 120 to 3,000. That's the power that the Holy Spirit has. That's the power that the fire of Christ has. So I began to think, Christ, what, Jesus, what does that mean for us? God wants us to know that 
there's, a, there's something that he wants to birth inside of us. He wants to breathe his breath of life. He wants his fire to, to rest on top of us. Just like, you know, they say it, it's like a fire rested on top of all the, uh, all the people that were there. He wants that to happen to us. And when that happens to us, not only are we, are we going to birth a new thing, but we're, always, we're also going to grow at a rapid rate. Once we get into that 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 place, I don't even want to say comfort, because when, sometimes when you think of comfort, we think of like really being um, lackadaisical. But once we get into a, a, a really good groove of Christ, we begin to really um, get comfortable with the Holy Spirit being within us. Because I feel like oftentimes a lot of people are not comfortable with the concept of being filled with the Holy Spirit or being on fire for Christ. We're not comfortable with those concepts. We think, oh man, like I'm only... You know, if you're in high school, I'm only 17, that's so weird. Or, you know, maybe you're in college, so I'm only 22, that's weird. Or maybe, you know, you're you're a, a professional, a career, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 something, that's so weird to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we, we think that's like a grandma or grandpa thing. So we're not able to really like go to the new heights and dimension that God wants us to do. But God wants, doesn't want us to, you know, be 80 years old and filled with the Holy Spirit. God wants us right now, when we're able-bodied, when we're young, you know, young adults, young professionals, that we can be on fire for him. Because not only will it manifest in the spiritual and in the church life, because this growth, this birth that God wants to happen, it's not only a church thing, a four walls thing, but it's a life thing. We'll grow in our own lives. Because God doesn't just want us to be like, you know, good hand clappers and, and good singers and, and good preachers. God wants us to be excellent at everything that we do. That's what it means when he says, you're to be the head and not the tail above and not beneath. That's wherever you go. It's not just talking about, you know, getting up on, you know, your brothers and sisters at church being number one here. No, that's not, that's not what God wants. He wants all of us who are here to be number one wherever we may go as we move on in society. And us, the first thing that we have to do is just accept the Holy Spirit and allow it to just manifest in our lives. So what do we need to do? How do we get these things done? The first thing is we have to get serious with our prayer life. We have to have that relationship with Christ. It can't just be religiosity. It has to be relationship, communication with Christ. Then the second thing is we have to get serious with the gospel, the good news. We have to believe in the good news. We have to get to understand what the good news means, not just what, is, what does the Bible mean, interpreting it, but what does it mean for you specifically? It has to become something that's personal. Once we get serious about our prayer life and we get serious about the good news, then we'll, we'll be able to easily do these next things. One, set aside your own agenda, whatever your plans are. We already spoke about agendas being things that block us. Agendas are, are, are things that they don't allow the Holy Spirit to manifest how it, how it can because we have our own agenda, we have our own plan, so we kind of like set God aside. So we have to set our, set our own agenda aside. Then we have to take God for his word. I remember when our sister Gabby was, was praying again, she began, in her prayer, she began to talk about his word being true. No matter what it is that you're going through, the, whatever God has spoken to you, that being true. And we spoke about it the first Friday of the month. We spoke about it that even in those silent periods with God, even in that silent period, we have to trust in his word. What did he tell you on day one? Because whatever God told you on day one, even though day 75 through like 150 may be quiet, the words on day one are still true. So you have to take them for his word and believe that that thing will happen. And then the other thing is, you have to listen to God's advice. That means you have to learn to get into that quiet place where you can be one-on-one -on -one with Christ and not even, not even, not even praying anymore. I remember at the retreat this year, we did something called Power Half Hour, where it was just you just staying there and just listening to what God has to say to you. God, what do you want to tell me? You have to begin to meditate. And people always say meditate on the word. That's what it means. It means there's a point where you know, you're praying, you've heard the word, you've prayed, and now you're just allowing God to speak to you. What does this word really mean? What do you want to do in my life? And then also listening to his advice, his advice also means your brothers and sisters that are near you who that you believe God is working through, sometimes God will use them to say something and impart something in your life. That's also listening to his advice. When we begin to do that, we'll be able to see the growth that the, the and acts that happen in 24 hours. From 120 people, they grew to 3,120. God wants to birth something new in you and me, and he wants us to grow at rapid rates. There's no reason for us to be stagnant as Christians, but if we allow God to renew us, 
and we allow the, his fresh winds and his fresh fire to come in our lives, we'll see growth. Not only will we see growth, but wherever we go, whatever's dry and dead, it'll be decimated and new life will be able to be birthed. And that's what God wants to do to us. So just like when we were singing earlier, we said, if you provide the fire, God, I'll provide the sacrifice. And if you pour out the spirit, then I'll open up. God wants people today to make that decision to be the sacrifice that will be on fire for God wherever you may go. And to be that person who's open to his Holy Spirit. Because sometimes his Holy Spirit will tell you to do things that you're like, what? But you have to be open to it and trust in God and see what level that he's going to take you in. So I hope that this message bless you. And I hope that we as a people can really embrace the Holy Spirit. Because when we embrace the Holy Spirit, we'll be in church, we'll be a people who will allow the fire of God to manifest. And all his gifts, all his fruits, all his talents, everything in the Bible that we read about, that sometimes we're like, God, but where is that in my life? Where is that in my friend's life? Those things will become, you know, more common in our lives. Amen.